Welcome back to the Trial of Teatex. If you're a crazy cat who leaps in halfway, then know Teatex is a software house whose name is usually followed by a shudder. If you're wondering why, then know they genuinely tried to convince Capcom to release the game you're watching in the background as Street Fighter 2 rather than Capcom writing their own one. But as a Master System owner, I didn't really know this and I'd always thought they were okay. So we're playing all 17 games they made on History's Greatest Console, including the one that wasn't released, to find out if they're top or bottom tier. Tex. And we resume with the score at a would be suspicious if I was that smart, for good, for bad, with a Capcom icon. Strider. Legendarily, Strider is the stated favourite game of retro gamer editor Darren Jones but I'm not sure he was thinking of the Master System version when he said that. That said, it's a good first impression. It's a nice little intro a track loop. The same Capcom high score table we saw in Mercs and a bit of graphical trickery I'm not sure I'd believe the SMS was even pulling off if I couldn't see with my own eyes that I'm running this on a completely stock original machine. But if we wanted to just spend 30 minutes watching pretty graphics without a game to play, We'd play God of War come at me internet, so let's press start. If you had to describe Strider as anything, it's the intersection of walk and punch, like say, ninja, and a platformer. But it's cleverer than that as a game. Ian Strider has a bunch of abilities not including his incredibly showy jumping. He can climb walls, hang under platforms and leap up, and he's got a punchy, swishing, blady attack. All of which you'd think might be tricky to render down onto an 8-bit console, but Teatex have excelled themselves here. The jump is, I grant you, a little short of frames, but even Sega R&D's own conversion to the Mega Drive is hardly technically perfect. That said, there are compromises. The backgrounds aren't, for instance, and a lot of the design and enemy density is noticeably reduced. It's a very playable game though, the level design is interesting and there's some enemy variety. Everything appears to have an attack pattern you can predict too. If I had gripes, I do not like the number of blind drops and jumps though, although the game is smart enough to rarely punish you for such things. Sega Retro notes that, less understandably, the story is also gutted, leaving characters having conversations entirely consisting of telling you you're not going to defeat an unnamed master. And, spoiler alert, the game ends implying that the entire game was a simulation for the real mission. Sega Retro seems down on this, but I like it as an excuse for converting a game to a lower machine. I don't know if it's Teatex's invention, but given it's only on their version, it seems like it. Bosses are my downfall as always, and the first one ending up being vulnerable in all states feels like a waste of potential. The second proper one though is where the wheels truly come off. The game has exhibited really quite a lot of slowdown up to this point already, but this boss is a mess of half-displayed sprites and moves at a glacial pace, something that doesn't improve when we move on to the next ice level. I'm on the fence here. The accusation normally levelled at Teatex is that they didn't care, and that is demonstrably not true here. Still though, despite commendable ambition and the fact that something is very nice under the surface here, you wouldn't want to play it even when it's completable in under 15 minutes. A no, but remind me I owe Teatex the benefit of the doubt next time I'm on the fence. The Flintstones. So this one is notorious. The original computer game is renowned for terrible design and even worse gameplay. This is the only Sega console game that Grand Slam ever finished. Although they had a second, Die Hard 2, cancelled by Sega because, to put not too fine a point on it, it was crap. Worse, that game apparently was also Teatex's doing. The poor tents are, well, let's just say they're not great tents. There's a couple of reasons for optimism. Firstly, this isn't a Teatex game, it was originally by Chrysalis under their old name Teak Software. Secondly, this is three years after the other versions came out, so surely they knew what they were working with. Thirdly, this theme tune, which is a lovely attempt. The game has four levels, which seems tight, but that's going to be the least of your worries, and the 8-bit computer crowd know what's coming. This is the first one, and your job is simple. 
You need to paint the wall before you need to leave for bowling because your wife controls your life in a way that you'll have to take from me was very funny in about 1963. Given you later find out Fred is in the final of an important tournament, but the wall apparently has to be painted now anyway, it's even more absurd. At least, while you're doing that, Wilma is going to take care of the- oh no she isn't. As Fred, you need to paint the wall using a paintbrush that does about two strokes, can only be filled from a paint can that appears to be nailed to the floor on the opposite side of the room, and while supervising your child, who constantly escapes and starts doodling on the wall. I imagine that's because she appears to be in a playpen that has no back. Worse, if you pick up pebbles, then you drop the paintbrush, which immediately buggers off. And all on that aforementioned tight time limit, which for some reason is five full egg timers, and not say, one egg timer, which runs at one fifth the speed. The reason I said to disregard the four levels is that on the computers, this level is notoriously hard, and virtually no one has legitimately got past it. Spoiler alert, neither have I, and I've played this for 30 minutes. I even tried little tricks like realising pebbles can only doodle the lower half of the wall, so do the top half first. Try to avoid rescuing her, and you can do the top half mostly undisturbed. Or you could, if the controls weren't finicky, if it were possible to reliably move the ladder rather than climb it more than one time in three, if the game didn't make you automatically pick up pebbles if you're within half a mile of her, and if the paintbrush did, well, anything much. And also, and this isn't even gameplay related, their TV is facing the wrong way and that really annoys me. So again, something of a dilemma. Because despite everything I've said, this is the best version of this game and it's Teartex's only version. And because I did kinda enjoy the 30 minutes I played of level 1. You know what, if this had been a 1988 port alongside the computers, I might even have given them this one. But they had three years to improve this or at least tone down the difficulty of level 1 to mildly possible. And they didn't. So no. Super Kickoff. So to make it clear immediately, I'm on the sensible soccer side of the early 1990s football fight. Sensible soccer, of course, is on the Master System, and if you're just looking for some football on your Say Great Bit, then go straight there. It's a fine conversion of what 30 years on is still the best arcade football game of all time. Kickoff, I was always much less enthused by, be it the first or second iteration of the game. But it invented Aftertouch, say the Kickoff fans. Sensible ripped that off. Well, no. No, they didn't. Not only are there multiple examples of prior art before any Kickoff game was released, one of those examples is in a game by Sensible Software. Kickoff has its fans, though, and they would have been excited to get a console version on their Master System at a time when even the Mega Drive was short of football games that were worth a damn. So we pick a game between United and Palace from the meagre selection of totally not real teams and give it a go. And to be blunt, even the kickoff fans aren't going near this. On the plus side, the player's movement is just fine. There's a map, which is always nice, and while you wouldn't think have a score and a clock on the screen was a big ask for a football game, these were very different times. As soon as you have the ball, it goes to crap though. Your players don't appear to have the slightest control over it, but are instead just pinball bumpers you move around. Further, you don't have any control over the goalkeepers at all, so all that's going to ever happen is the goalie tries to root one you, perhaps understanding you can't do tactics with a pinball table anyway. Nonetheless, not being able to build from the back or put together any moves invalidates this as a football game entirely anyway. The rotten cherry on the stale cake, though, is that all this can't even be done at speed. Frequently, most notably, when a player takes the ball off you, the game slows to an utter crawl for a few seconds before suddenly going back to normal. It's the kind of thing you'd pin to a confused emulator if there wasn't an obvious reason we know better. The sound effects are near non-existent too, the goal scored being greeted with all the enthusiasm of Coldplay making an appearance at Bloodstock. No one can have been happy with this port. If you're not a kickoff fan, it'll do absolutely nothing to change your mind. And if you are, 
then this broken and stuttery version of your favourite football fix will make you actively angry. Relegation awaits. World Class Leaderboard There are games which define genres. Some of them we know. Gran Turismo all but created the car toy box racing game. Doom defined shooting tropes that still exist today. Sensible Soccer, we've already mentioned, owns arcade football games. The next game is part of this elite group. Almost every golf game, at the very least, has the option of the classic three-click system, where a moving bar lets you set your power and degree of smacking the thing sideways. It's such an obvious way to do it, surely it's the way everyone always did it. And that's what this game gave us. By common consent, Leaderboard by Access Software, later responsible for the Link series, is the golf game that first implemented it. A year later came World Class Leaderboard, and a full four years after that first game, here comes Teartex's conversion of the sequel. We've heard that story before in this video. Leaderboard can come across as clunky. Options like the map are hidden behind the second button, and the 3D world draws in procedurally to spare the blushes of the machine. This is a common tactic of the time though, and it's as quick as it is anywhere on comparable games. What's more comforting is Leaderboard still plays like a good game of golf. It's only a few courses, but they are chosen well, and it includes the home of the sport, St Andrews in Scotland, which is as recognisable as it ever could be. There's even some little aids to help the cack handed, as showcased in the footage I've chosen here. Novice mode reduces to virtually nothing the amount of hook and slice on the shot, meaning you mostly just have to judge your club and power. It's not all roses. Much like Kickoff, this is a remarkably quiet conversion, with no music beyond the title screen, and sound effects that at best could be described as understated. And yet, push a ball into the bunker, and there's some decent quality sampled speech to tell you this. And as far as I can tell, just speech for that. There was nothing but a low effort crowd noise for a birdie, and absolutely nothing for bogeys, pars, balls on the green in regulation, or any of the other common situations that occurred during my rounds. Speech I know to be present on the PC version. Still though, while you might feel there might have been room for little jazzing it up, this is a perfectly reasonable conversion. And while they're not getting any style points, Teartex can have a real point for this one. Sonic's Edusoft. And now to the one that didn't get released. Someone let Teartex at a Sonic the Hedgehog game. A Sonic educational game. It was being written somewhere in 1991, so I've put it at the end of the titles from that year in this list. It was due to be published, like so many of Teartex's games, by US Gold then it wasn't. Properly secret this one. Despite as much of it as we have being written in 1991, the game was a myth for a long time afterwards. When a Wikipedia page for it with some information was created in 2006, it was removed for being a joke. A year later, someone posted a screenshot to SMS Power where everyone also thought it was a fake. The site admin even giving a list of reasons why it couldn't be real. Then in March, a person simply calling themselves The Programmer posted some details, but crucially, no actual proof of its existence. All went quiet. Then in April 2008, the ROM appeared out of the blue on Sega Retro, and then a fixed version, which claims to be to enable the game to work on more emulators. In reality, this fixed version is the only one that works in my Master System 1 as well. The man known simply as the programmer pops up again. It's worth a read, but the most interesting point is the reason it uses the 16-bit Sonic sprites, making it look like a fake, is because SMS Sonic hadn't turned up yet. Remember, 1991 is the year the first Sonic game came out. Anyway, there's definitely room on YouTube for the longer version of this later, and you better believe I'll do it. What about the game? As mentioned, it's unfinished, but actually it's pretty cool. Aimed at five-year-olds, it asks simple maths and word-finding problems as races against other characters, whose speed depends on the difficulty selected. I found it difficult on my controller to make it access the corners sometimes, 
but only sometimes, suggesting the game is doing something. But otherwise, it all holds up pretty well. It looks nice too. As SMS Power pointed out, there's a couple of points it's actually cheating to do stuff that should be impossible on the machine. Simple though it looks. The best bit though, is how pissed off Sonic looks to be using the helicopter. Not gonna lie, laughed at that for five minutes straight. It's amazing a Sonic game went undiscovered this long really, especially one that is technically the first open world Sonic game, and maybe even, depending on when they started compared to 8-bit Sonic 1, the first non-Sonic team one. I'm not going to rate this, it's not done, but absolutely get yourself a copy of the patched version. I couldn't not show you it since we're cataloguing tier text. Tell you what, let's burn that benefit of the doubt I promised earlier. If this thing ends up as an 8-8 draw, we're giving them the win based on this. Strider 2. So there are two Strider 2s. A 1999 arcade machine and PS1 port, which I'm sure you're probably guessing isn't our focus here, and this. An original game produced with the knowledge, but without the involvement of Capcom themselves. So not to worry any of you, but this is basically Strider Human Killing Machine variant. Teatex wrote the game for the 8-bit computers in 1990, before even the conversion of the original to the Master System, and then two years later handled this conversion in-house. This gave them freedom on the story, and so they took the chance to complete the reference from the cop-out of calling the original a simulation. The manual makes it clear that that was practice for this, the real mission. Which leaves two things unexplained. One, that Ian Strider now has throwing stars he apparently hasn't bothered practicing with, and two, that all the levels and enemies appear to have nothing to do with the original simulation. I think whoever wrote the simulation has some questions to answer. It is unrecorded if there is canonically an in-universe tier text, but if so I know where I'm placing my bets. This means pressure, and a lot more of this game is going to be something we can judge them on. It's noticeably less busy with humans than the design for the original game, although I say this as someone yet to get off the first level of five. It's also placing a lot more premium on exploration than the original. Picking your way through the level is very much about figuring out the level design compared to the much more linear progress of the original. It's a commendable attempt to do something a little different to the original, and takes advantage of the fact this was never an arcade game, even if it does retain both a credit system, you get two, and a time limit. It makes mistakes. For some reason in level one the biggest problem you're going to have is avoiding birds of all things. They're everywhere, they're deadly, and like most enemies in this game they push you back a quite absurd distance. The game also makes the mistake for an exploration game of making the answer sometimes be a blind jump, especially difficult as this first level does not obey rational physics for buildings, and exhibits the common 8-bit problem of is this a wall or not? The end result of this is one especially egregious section, where you make that blind jump just in time for a bird to dragon punch you straight off the end of the platform to an instant death. The boss too has an instant death attack, and one that is really finicky and easy to get caught by, as it needs a full tilt sideways jump to dodge. You can do better if you collect all the secret tokens in the level first, which gives you a robot power up, but doing that reliably in a single credit even on level 1 is difficult. And so I'm left in a similar position to Strider 1 here, and ultimately, despite this clearing up almost every problem with that conversion and being a very technically solid and imaginative game, this just isn't quite close enough that Benefit of the Doubt is going to save them. Sorry Teatex, this is a no. Olympic Gold one kind of marvels they got this gig. It's not like Teatex hadn't fully cemented their reputation by early 1992. It might not seem it now, where they just fart out a reskin of the Sonic gets around more than your mum Nintendo Olympic game every four years, but back then there were few bigger licenses than the Olympics. But nonetheless, US Gold, Sega, Teatex, and a comedy novelty check from a leading purveyor of sugar water combined in such a way that Olympic Gold was the official video game of the Barcelona Olympics on all three Sega machines. And it's not an easy license to do any justice to. 
For a start, Barcelona 92 featured 257 events. Teatex had room for seven. It's a lazy trope of these games to pick stadium events, lean heavily into athletics and basically make a decathlon game. Teatex are to be commended in at least making an attempt to avoid that. Granted we've got both the 100m flat and 110m hurdles for some reason, but those are the only track events and we've restricted ourselves to the very different hammer throw and pole vault from the field list. Still, this leaves only three events to cover the other 210 or so, and in choosing archery and diving they've at least made an effort at diversity. The endurance 200m swimming closes out the list, playing near identically to the 1500m in most athletics games. The other difficulty in these games, especially with primitive capabilities, is getting any sense of the atmosphere in. Teatex at least make an opening and closing ceremony that can only come from the Olympics. They have though avoided too many in-game references to the official mascots, Kobe the naked hugbear and Petra the existential nightmare. Points 2 for the game being all but identical to the 16-bit version. Options 2 in the form of single events or mini Olympics to cut out the diving, I mean events you don't like. The events themselves play traditionally, but well. The two running events are predictably button mashing affairs, but the diving, hammer and archery all avoid it entirely, and endurance swimming requires you to manage an unseen strategy meter rather than hammer your controller into oblivion. Predictably, these skill events are the hardest to master, and I still can't dive worth a damn for instance, but the rest I can do okay in, and the opposing athletes all have their individual strengths so no one runs off into the distance on the medal table. When I did a roundup of 12 cheaply available SMS games you should use to start your collection a couple of years ago, this was the only tier text game to make the list, and I'd still stand behind it. Other than perhaps Epix's weird world games, there's not really any competition on the Master. Teatex were given a difficult brief here, and they succeeded. Yes. Winter Olympics. No Master System games in 1993 for Teatex, but we should highlight what they were doing, because it was a conversion of International Rugby Challenge, a game so broken Amiga Power gave it 2%. It had a bug where you could get a point ahead, pause, and because the timer didn't stop when you were paused, win the game without lifting another finger. But that's the thing. Teatex are responsible for none of that. Their Mega Drive conversion got a solid 80% from AP Sister Mag Mega, and other than thinking that Americans can play rugby without stopping every 10 yards for a nap and an advert break, was pretty much spot on. As the SMS entered its UK twilight in 1994, Teatex were there with one last release, and the more astute of you might have realised what it is. Winter Olympics Lilyhammer 94. It's weird, but as with Olympic Gold, this one is on its own. Despite the SMS being a mainstream machine for the Winter Games of both 1988 and 1992, before the Games adopted an alternate schedule with the Summer Event with Lilyhammer in 94, this is again the only one on the system. It is obvious to a fault that under this there is a lot of the code that ran Olympic Gold, and why wouldn't there be? But nonetheless there's a lot here. We've gone up from 7 to 10 events, and while perhaps the luge and bobsled are fairly similar, as well as the four major skiing events, even if you count those entire sports as one event each, that's still 6, and I don't think we can honestly call the running events and swimming in Olympic Gold as being that distinct. The luge, and indeed bobsled, should be commended for being brave enough to go full 3D. Once you figure them out, they're both deceptively simple driving games where your main task is going to be to preserve your speed by not smacking your vehicle, or indeed your left hip, into an unyielding icy concrete side. The bobsled involves a button mashing start, one of the few times you'll use that in this game, and it's a lot quicker. It makes a big difference and it's probably not a surprise it delivers one of my gold medals. The four ski events differ in how narrow their gates are and that's about it. They correctly make their controls relative to the player and not to the screen, unlike my old friend Crash Dummies, but actually that game probably has the better actual responsiveness. No one understands moguls. Not in real life, not in the game. 
It's basically a device for taking perfectly good knees and reducing them to their component atoms. Here too, it's confusing and probably one of the worst events. Speed Skating 2 is interesting and another event where a unique arena of surprising detail for a Master System licensed game has been used. You won't see this again, and if you're doing as badly as I do at the start of this, you won't see this one for long either. Again a unique setup for the ski jump, which is a bloody tricky one, but again is a unique control scheme. I want to talk about the biathlon though, which as we all know is like a heteroathlon but you can do it in winter and summer. The more common winter version here, and if you didn't know, the biathlon is an endurance cross-country skiing event broken up occasionally by the need to stop and shoot some things, because if you're going to carry a giant gun on a ski trip, you might as well use it. The skiing is done by the traditional endurance route we saw in Olympic Gold, where you need slower but measured button mashing. The shooting is a high accuracy retread of the archery minigame only with much smaller targets. Missing will cost you a time penalty at the end of the run. There's no visible competition, so the long treks between sections can sometimes drag. It's unique though, and it's rather a shame the game runs out of ideas at this point and just chucks the remaining two ski events at you in succession. Still, if you're playing this, you drop a couple of the skiing events and have an 8 medal Olympics. It's another good game, and crucially, every event works. Most of them are different, it's technically damned good, and with controller passing, it even supports four players. A point for Teardex. And that's the end of the games we got in the UK from Teardex on the Master System. But we're not done. FIFA International Soccer. Yes, that FIFA. And the version that very few people know exists. Famously a Mega Drive game originally, with the 95 entry amazingly being an exclusive on the Sega 16-bit if you ever need some gaming pub trivia, FIFA has appeared at some point on literally everything since. EA never published on SMS though, leaving their games to be occasionally brought across by Domark, US Gold, Tech Magic, and of all people, Atari's Homan Tengen. None of those wanted a crack at FIFA though, or perhaps just didn't want to pay the licensing fee for a machine crumbling in even its second most successful worldwide region. In Brazil though, local distributor Tectoy had another four years of first party support on the go, and they were more than happy to subcontract Teatex for at least a last Master Hurrah System Hurrah, with a title that like a lot of late era SMS, is a Game Gear port. You can tell this from the menu. Look at the tiny area it takes up on the screen, which I haven't resized here. This, if you don't know, is because while the Game Gear is a very similar machine to its home console older brother, it has a lower resolution. Lazy conversions don't fix this. See most notably this Brazil only version of Mortal Kombat 3, which is a complete mess compared to Probe's lovely attempts at the first two for a wider market. FIFA here looks good. The credits reveal that the original developers extended play productions and their parent company EA Canada were involved, and that Tectoy themselves also had a hand. Possibly unsurprisingly in Football Mad Brazil, it does seem that genuine effort was expended to make this as good as it could be. Starting a game, this bears out. While the menu is Game Gear Res, the game itself is running in what for the sake of argument we'll call full resolution. It looks about as good as it was going to. We're retaining the isometric look of the 16-bit one, and while you always want a map and a timer in any football game, it's worth pointing out that even the Mega Drive version doesn't keep these things permanently on screen. Sim has never quite been the right word for FIFA, but it'll do here as an indication of making a football game that moves at a more football pace, with visibly more football content than something like Sensi, which is more about creating recognisable football drama. In contrast to more modern games, Passing is not quite automatic, with you having to judge that power yourself to allow a two button system to also be used for through passes. It's not perfect, especially as just occasionally the master system can't quite keep up with the scrolling and the ball flies off screen. There's also some predictable glitching throwing this many sprites around, possibly also due to pushing the game into a higher resolution. It could do with being a bit quicker and slightly more responsive, but it's worth remembering Isometric FIFA was never the quickest of games. It plays well though, better than you'd probably imagine it would, 
and certainly a massive improvement over the last time Teartex tried to do a football game on this system. Notable too in improvements over that original is when a goal happens, the game bothers to acknowledge it, both with crowd noise and the impressive downporting of the LCD score animations from the Mega Drive. There's multiple of these and all of them are imaginative and look great. In a two player game, this is important rubbing it in material. And that's the thing here, as we close out our tier text adventure. The main accusation levelled at them was often that they didn't bother. Here, in a circumstance they probably could have got away with it, they bothered. This is a good game of football. It's probably the second best football game on the system, and that's only because the sensible soccer conversion to the Sega is a minor miracle. It's a damn shame we didn't get this. I believe it would have done well enough, and I don't think a direct EA production of this would have been any better. I wouldn't exactly advise paying to import a copy from Brazil like I did, but still it's probably the most obscure version of FIFA there will ever be, and it does not deserve it. A final point for the Teartex. Which brings us to a conclusion. Eight all, and thus victory awarded because of the unreleased game. Victory, by the narrowest of margins, awarded on a tie-break, predicated on a Sonic the Hedgehog maths game aimed at five-year-old children. If I think back on this epic adventure, I'm not sure it could ever have gone any other way. But this is the thing. Teartex are justifiably famous for a reason. Multiple games in this lineup proved it. But that almost makes those incidents more annoying. Because when they were given time and space, when they tried, Teartex were capable of, if not exactly greatness, certainly goodness. And yet, time after time, mostly on other systems, they just didn't. To close out the story, if I asked you when Teartex closed, you'd probably guess soon after this. Not so. They made games as far as 2003's Carrera Power Slide on the GBA. And then, pivoting to a more hardware based business, they survived until as late as August 2021. So a year removed from that, perhaps this is as good a time as any to pay as much of a tribute as deserved. Teartex, you were often awful. Often infuriating. But the history of gaming would have been a poorer place had we never known you. A grudging but heartfelt posthumous pardon for your crimes from this channel to Donald Campbell, John Prince and everyone involved.